Um, today's verse is Romans chapter 14, 7 through 12. And at first glance, this piece of scripture from Romans looks a little bit like a prescription for politeness from his manners. The references to what people eat and to the conduct of servants are illustrations, analogies for a broader message. In our scripture, you'll hear Paul say that we don't dictate what people must eat nor do we judge others. In the same way, we should not judge the adequacy of their faith. You'll notice in verse 8 that these matters are put into perspective. Whether we live or die, we are in the Lord's. Paul says there's no such thing as getting a 60% or an 85% grade on life. It's all or nothing. You're in or you're out. There are no in-betweens, no lukewarms. And the decision is God's, not ours. What each one of us must do is to give more than thanks by living to the Lord, to the limits of our capacity, and living, letting the rest to God. The significant thing about this passage is the way Paul brings into even seemingly trivial concerns the core principles of his faith. And these are verses 7 through 12. <clears throat> we do not live to ourselves. We do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die... We die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. <coughs> to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be the Lord of both the living and the dead. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister, or you who despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to the Lord. So then each of us will be accountable to God. Thank you, Kathy, for sharing our scripture with us this morning. The scripture from Romans is referring to believers. Believers like you and me. Both strong Christians and those weak in faith. Paul was addressing the total Christian community made up of persons who were from various backgrounds and convictions. Some who saw things this way, and others who saw things that way. A problem had occurred. The more mature Christians looked down, looked down on those who were considered weaker in their faith, possibly newer to the faith, possibly more liberal in the faith, possibly more conservative by someone's measure of these kinds of things. The weaker person in their faith However, wasn't innocent either. They judged the stronger Christian for taking more liberties, for seemingly owning truth as if it was theirs to own and not God's, for unfairly disregarding their point of view. Though new to the faith, they still have them. The main issue of was questions of conscience, where Christians differed as to doubts about whether it was right or wrong for them to eat certain foods. Paul is trying to make the point here that God's approval, God's approval is more significant than the approval or the disapproval of any person. We are accountable to God, and to God be the glory. In the opening part of the verse, Paul says that Christians do not live to themselves or die to themselves. We live or die to the Lord. Because we are the Lord. Why do we do that? Why do we live and die to the Lord? We do that because we are the Lord's. 
We do not own ourselves, plain and simple. And this attachment, God owning us, that relationship, this attachment to the Lord does not cease with death, but goes with us into eternity. Paul says in Philippians 1.20, It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be to put to shame in any way, but that by my speaking with all boldness, Christ will exalted, be exalted now as always in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul is stressing here that a good relationship and perspective with and of the Lord is the key to life and what we should be striving for above all else. Our judgments of others get us nowhere. And frankly, friends, the judgments we have of others are beneath <coughs> us, are beneath us as Christians. As we look at this scripture, we can find applications for our own lives. At this season of the year, we automatically think about giving thanks. Thanksgiving for all that God has done for us throughout the past year. I chose the title, More Than Thanks, for this message today because Paul tells the people, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. In other words, we will all one day give an account of our lives to God. We will give more than thanks. We will give an account of our lives. If we take this scripture to heart, our lives will be lived in such a way that we can give more than thanks, more than thanksgiving to God, because our lives will have been pleasing to Him, and we will be approved of God for all eternity. In the end, that is what counts, friends. How we live our lives, how we share our faith, how we love one another. The first application for our lives that this scripture from Romans provides is that we, friends, we take too much responsibility for others. Way too much responsibility. In this scripture, Paul saw that Christians were spending too much time trying to deal with problems and issues that really didn't amount to that much, but which were robbing them of their joy, robbing them of their peace. Robbing them of seeing the goodness of God. He was asking them, why are you spending all of your energies on things which are so unimportant that they won't matter in the end? Why all this clashing and bickering among you? Many times we allow ourselves to take too much responsibility for others. We make it our business to check out what another Christian is doing or not doing and make our judgment about them because of it. Many churches even try to make up a big long laundry list of rules that people must conform to to be a part of our church.
Paul was experiencing this in the Church of Rome. He asked, why all this clashing? Why all this contradicting one another? You're spending all your time trying to make, take responsibility for another person's actions, and you don't need to do that. You know, Satan loves to take our eyes off the Lord by causing us to take ownership for the actions of others. We become a self-appointed inspector. We say, it's my duty as a Christian to point out what this person is or is not doing and then straighten them out about it. A strong Christian may look down on a person who is weaker in their faith, saying they think they are a Christian. They haven't a clue what Christianity is all about. A weaker Christian may judge the person who is stronger in the faith and say, he shouldn't be doing that because it's wrong. How can they say it's okay to, and you fill in the blank? How can they say it's okay to bring coffee in the sanctuary? How can they say it's okay to, you mean? Paul is saying, whoa! <coughs> make some adjustments here. Why do you, who are strong in the faith, try to depreciate the faith of the weaker person? And why do you, who are weaker, judge the strong? You are both trying to take responsibility for something that you don't need to do. It is not your job. Don't worry about taking this on to yourself. The Bible called the message says it this way. So tend to your own knitting. You've got your hands full just taking care of your own life before God. Paul goes on to say, forget about deciding what's right for each other. Here's what you need to be concerned about. That you don't get in the way of someone else's salvation, making life more difficult than it already is. Two brothers lived on adjoining farms and they began to have conflict with one another. It was the first serious rift in 40 years in farming side-by-side -side farms, sharing machinery, trading labor and goods without a hitch. Then things began to fall apart. It began with a misunderstanding that grew into a major difference. Finally, it exploded into an exchange of bitter words, followed by weeks and weeks and months and years of silence. One morning, there was a knock on John's door. He opened it to find a man with the carpenter's toolbox. The man said, I'm looking for a few days' work. Perhaps you have a few small jobs here and there. Could, could I help you? Yes, said the older brother. I am just the job for you. Look across that creek at that farm. That's my bro younger brother's farm. Last week, there used to be a meadow there, but he took his bulldozer to the uh, river levee, and now it's a creek between us. Well, he may have done this to spite me, but I'll give him one better. See that pile of lumber curing by the barn? 
I want you to build me a fence, eight foot fence, so I won't have to see his sorry face again. The carpenter said, I think I understand the situation. Show me the nails and the post hole digger and I'll be able to do a job that pleases you. The older brother had to go into town for supplies, for some supplies, so he showed the carpenter the materials and then he was off for the day. And the carpenter set to work, working all day long, measuring, sawing him. About sunset, when the farmer returned, the carpenter had finished his job. The farmer's eyes opened and his jaw dropped. There was no fence. It was a bridge. A bridge stretching from one side of the creek to the other. A fine piece of work, beautifully done, the handrails perfect, and there on the far end of the bridge was his brother coming across, his hand outstretched. The older brother said, you're quite a carpenter. Build me a bridge after all I've said and done. The two brothers stood in the middle of the bridge. And they shook hands and then hopped. And they turned to see the carpenter hoisting his toolbox on his shoulder. And they said, no, wait. Stay a few days. We've got a lot of other projects for you. I'd love to stay on, said the carpenter. But I have many walls not to build. Remember, these brothers were people whom Christ died for. Just like you and me. Can we build a bridge instead of a wall? That's giving more than thanks. A bridge instead of a wall. You might say, I don't take too much responsibility for other people. I don't judge people. I don't criticize people. I am not building any walls. And if that's true, praise be to God. This is, however, a common problem among people. And it's a trick of the enemy to get us so tied up with looking at other people that we get our eyes off the Lord. We can give more than thanks for praying for people that struggle with this. Here's the second application for our lives that we can find in this Romans passage. And this is it. Christ is the judge. We are not. Christ is the judge. Paul told them Christ will be the judge because he has the authority and the ability to do it. When we attempt to judge, we are moving into his domain. Wrong. We are usurping Christ's role. Friends, he both died and arose that he might be the Lord of both the living and the dead. He is the Lord of them that are living to rule them. He is the Lord of those that are dead to receive them. He is the Lord. He is the judge. We are not anyone's master. All belongs to the Lord, whether weak or strong. Paul challenges us. Don't look down on those who have strict convictions 
or to condemn those with more lenient convictions. Give more than thanks. <coughs> Accept one another as Christ has accepted you. There are probably some Christians that you are stretching yourself to accept. I know there are for me. Can we commit to that tendency that we have to stretch ourselves to accept some of the new Christians of today, the way they worship? Yes. But here's the thing. Paul is saying, we are all the people of God. Even the way we practice our faith, we are the people of God. Though we differ in this way or that way, he is saying all people have to answer to God for themselves. It is not our job to answer for them. We give more than thanks when we let Christ be the judge and get ourselves out of his business. The third application for our lives is the title of this sermon, Give More Than Thanks. Galatians 6, 4 says, all must test their own work. Then that work, rather than their neighbor's work, will become a cause of pride. Good Others are not accountable to us, and we are not accountable to them. We are, in the end, accountable to God and to God alone. Knowing this takes, hopefully, a lot of pressure off of us concerning others. At the same time, though, it puts pressure on us to make sure we are spending our lives in such a way as to please God. When we realize that the main business of our lives is to please God and not others, what <coughs> would life be like? How would your life change? What would you begin to do? What would you stop doing? Ephesians 5, 15 and 16 says, Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people but wise, making the most of the time, because the days are evil. You just need to look at Paris to know how true that is. Matthew Henry said, it will not be asked at the last day who ate meat and who ate her herbs, who kept holy days and who did not, who was a conformist and who was not, but who feared God and worked righteousness and who did not. Friends, we must give more than thanks. It's not enough to give our thanks, sort of like lip service, to God, we are to live that thanks out as we accept one another, love one another, and move closer to God. We will appear before God judged on the merits of Christ's death, sanctified by the Spirit of grace to live in peace and love and joy with one another. What kind of an account do you think you will be able to give to God on that day? Amen.